All right, everyone, welcome in for another Facts Not Feelings Friday. We're super, super excited to have the one and only Alan Crotch. Uh, hey, Alan is just a ball of sunshine. I'm really excited to have him on. Um, Alan and I, we've known each other for, I'm going to say like six, seven years, something like that. I think so. Something like that, yeah. And he is, I think anytime I had a question uh, that was way above my pay grade, or just was way too many ones and zeros or Google analytics or anything that was just way too geeky for me. I, I was calling you at that point. Cause I just, I didn't know. <laughs> so uh, I, there was one time I know we were going back and forth and I was, it was something to deal with dealer.com. And I just go, Hey, the, it just keeps kicking it out <clears throat> with Google analytics. We found out that dealer.com just was not, they couldn't do it. I'm not trying to throw dealer.com under the bus. Not at all. It was just, we were going back and forth and figuring out, and it was you, the Alan, that said, hey, they, they just don't do it. They're, they're, they're backing, just can't do this, what you're asking. So um, needless to say, Alan comes with a very, uh, very credible and amazing background on everything he does. So thank you, Alan, for being here. So yeah. My pleasure. Good to see you, Brooke. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, so Alan, a couple of things. Tell us a little bit about who you are, other than what I just obviously said, uh, and what you do and how you got in the industry and a little bit about you. Uh, okay, so I live in Bozeman, Montana, and I started the work from home thing back when you and I met, and uh, when we were both consultants working for CDK and then later Synchro, and so what I do is uh, I work from home, I ski, I fly fish, I mountain bike, uh, that's my life. There's probably a little more work in there than there is skiing, fly fishing, and mountain biking. But uh, uh, that's where I'm based. And uh, through the pandemic, which has been awful on, in a hundred ways, um, this is maybe some brightness that came out of it is this ability to run businesses remotely and to live in cool places and be able to to do your job and make a living. So uh, I've been in the car business, I don't know, maybe 20 years, kind of my second career. Um, got here by accident, uh, like almost everybody. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I got fired from a job. I was uh, working for a company based in London and I was in Italy for a sales meeting. I was flying high and thought I had it going on. And they, at this meeting, decided that uh, they were going to make a change. So I headed home without a job. And uh, I, I had, luckily, a, a soft landing in terms of severance. But I had this thing where I said, you know, I've never been out of work a day in my life since I'm about 18. And so I called a friend of mine and said, I got to go to work like now. I, you know, I, I've got a streak. And he put me to work in a BMW store. And I thought, okay, so I can do this for a few months until I found a real job. That's 20 years ago. And so here I am. <laughs> oh, we've all been there. This industry is so crazy how if you don't, if you don't get out like in the first couple of a little bit, it just sucks you in and you can't get out. I, I think every single well, well, <clears throat> I'll, I'll tell you, I did try to escape once. <laughs> almost, too about, many, almost. Uh, <laughs> I had done it for about five years and I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be a car guy forever. So I took a job as the VP of sales and marketing for a manufacturing company. I did that for three or four years and I got sucked back in and, <laughs> and this is where I've been ever since and uh, it's uh, become a part of me and uh, uh, it's been a really nice ride. It's so crazy how that happens. I think that there, I mean, there are definitely people who were born into it, you know, generation upon generation, but yep. it's very few and far between. I, I, I'm going to say very far few between most of us. It's just so, I mean, my background is the medical field. Uh, it's not yep. all what I did. It, the economy yep. went crazy. Uh, my job was very uh, specific in what I did. Uh, same thing. I was traveling abroad. I was living. I was all over the map, around the world, and they did away with my position. I was like, "Oh shit, what am I going to do now?" And so I had to find something. And a yeah. buddy, my buddy, 
it's like, Hey, my friend, uh, blah, blah, blah. And that's how I ended up in here. And so it was so random. And I took a job thinking, okay, I just need, I need a job. And that's the only reason why I took it very similar. All, you know, it's just for a couple of years. And here I, we uh, are. Brooke, 2022. I, <laughs> I think you've discovered something. I think we can boil it down to say that right before most car business careers, there is an oh shit moment. <laughs> yes, 100%. <laughs> it's so true. It's in, and, and once again, if you don't, and it's not a negative way to get out, it's just the car business is crazy. It's, it's, it does, it's been really good to us. Uh, and so it's, it's here, a, here. it is a good business. It's a crazy business. And you have to be um, crazy in ourselves to work in this business, but it, it, there's a lot of benefits to it, and it's treated us very, very well. So <laughs> I'm thankful to be in it. So uh, yeah, plus, I got to meet, meet you out of it. So I'm all yeah, so grateful for that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So you've been in it for 22 years now. Uh, you've had a couple of different positions throughout it, and now you are with Fuse. Tell us a little bit about Fuse. So uh, Fuse Auto Tech is a software company, a SaaS company, and. Uh, my history with Fuse goes back quite a long ways. <clears throat> when I was the director of marketing for Walzer Automotive Group uh, in Minneapolis, they're, uh, uh, I would say, a really progressive group, uh, close to 30 stores now. Back in year 2000, they went to one price selling, and that was completely focused on trying to create a better customer experience. By 2011, 2012, uh, on that journey to compete based on customer experience, they decided to move to single point of contact. So they uh, eliminated the traditional finance role and their salespeople, customer specialists handle the entire sale, selling the car, arranging financing, uh, selling F&I products and delivering the vehicle. And so in 2012, we were completely focused on speed because the, the key pain point that we discovered after we eliminated the negotiation, the back and forth, the uh, marching to the desk and marching back with a note type stuff, the key pain point we found was time where people were saying, you know, I've researched things on the internet. I've taken the test drive. I said, yes. Why does it take me three hours to give you my money? Why am I waiting in line to spend $50,000? Yeah. Why am I sitting in the lounge drinking bad coffee when I would like to get my car and go show my friends and take a drive? So based on that, we started to say, you know, we need to have technology enable these processes. And so we started to build Fuse. We had at that point three or four developers internally, and we built software that would work in a dealer group, not, not enterprise software, mind you, that uh, could be rolled out to a mass audience, but we built software to um, enable this process, speed things up. And I think the key is we had this thought that we should let machines do what machines do best. And what that means is math, keeping processes straight, making sure that every document signed, making sure the disclosures are there, that's stuff that a human being shouldn't do. Yeah. Human beings should build relationships. They should build trust. They should help customers discover the products they should buy. And they should enhance that relationship and enhance the loyalty of it. So fast forward to uh, 2019, um, Fuse uh, started to look at commercializing the product. And uh, the, the story here is that Andrew Walzer, who was the, is the CEO of Walzer Automotive Group, uh, met an entrepreneur who was a venture capitalist named uh, Ellie Wortman. And Ellie had been the co-founder of Vroom and taken that company public for a little over a billion dollars. And uh, Andrew said that, you know, we should be partners. Let's, 
you know, you invest in the company, you have experience helping to build SaaS companies, helping to scale them and grow them. And so this could be a, a nifty partnership. And so we did. And right now uh, we have about 45 employees. A lot of them are in Israel. We have software development in Tel Aviv, which is, um, well, it certainly rivals Silicon Valley, but outside of Silicon Valley, it's probably where the most sophisticated software in the world is being built right now. It's where GM Advanced Digital is. It's where Amazon Labs is. It's where Porsche Advanced Digital, Microsoft. I mean, there's a lot of heavyweights that that are after that talent in, in Tel Aviv. So um, we, uh, we started to grow this company and uh, we, we do digital transactions and that means a bunch of things. But here's, here's what I would say is different about our approach. <clears throat> and I'm gonna say that I think that most software companies and I'll even say the OEMs are looking in the wrong direction. Here's what I mean. Everybody's focused on digital retail, meaning selling a car online. <laughs> there's no problems to be solved there yet. There's opportunities, but there's very few problems, meaning people aren't sitting at home saying, you know, the thing I hate about buying a car is I can't spend 80 grand without seeing the car and give my money online. I mean, nobody's saying that. Mm -hmm. What they are saying is once I use a digital retail tool, maybe figure out a payment, which by the way is usually not exact, once I do the research, I go to edmunds.com, KBB, Carfax, et cetera, and I come to your store because I'd like to test drive the car and meet somebody who knows something about it. What they're saying is, this is the part that's jacked. I have to wait three hours and there's all kinds of people going back and forth. And you just promised me this kind of cool thing, this promise of digital retail, start online, finish in the store. But when I got to the store, the person said, yeah, you know, we don't use that exact system. Um, but, you know, my manager, he's really good at this and he can help you get a payment. And why don't you sit down? Okay. That's why people aren't happy. So we started in the store to fix that problem first. And then we moved online with a digital retail tool that's connected to that. So a completely different approach. If I were to be a little bit snarky, I'd say if you were a car dealer developing software, you would immediately see that the problem to be fixed is in the store. If you were a software company trying to sell to car dealers, you'd go, hey, digital retail, Amazon for car dealers. And yet we find that most customers they're, they still want to come and, and, and see the car. I, I'll make another point. So there's nothing in this world easier to sell online than an iPhone. Mm -hmm. Yet Apple spent $70 billion and counting to build 510 retail stores because they know that's where the emotion is created. That's where brands and loyalty are built. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's a funny thing happening right now. We've got franchise dealers who are investing like crazy in their facilities. And I think that's actually a good thing that we create these kind of temples to the brand where you go and you immediately feel special about the vehicle you're looking at. And it's a great place to shop. The industry is telling them, stay away, just do it all online. Okay. There, there's something kind of wrong about this message. I mean, it's everything. It's yeah. have a great online experience, but the in-store experience when it's done well is theater. And when you're not waiting around for three hours, it's a wonderful experience to see all of these cool cars, to meet people that know about them, to use some technology to buy your next car. And so I'm, I'm inspired by two things when I think about software that don't have much to do about the car business. First thing is buying a cup of coffee. So when we buy a cup of coffee now, you know, it's 
crazy, of course, the price, you know, we're paying four fifty for a coffee and mm -hmm. $3 for a Danish and this and that. But I don't feel so bad because it's all on a little screen in front of me. There's transparency in this point of sale system. Mm -hmm. And I get to control it. I can add the tip. I can pay however I want to pay. Small thing, not anything like a car dealership, but keep this in mind. Now let's jump into the Apple store. Everybody in that store has a cash register in their pocket. Yep. So when you say, yeah, I'd like the computer or I'd like the, uh, the mouse, the earpods, whatever it is, they go, terrific. And they take your money. They don't say, terrific, go wait in line. Oh, God, no. And so I think there's a couple things we learned from this. One, when you can show the customer the transaction on the screen and have them participate, almost like we do when we buy a cup of coffee, we're participating. Uh, and when more employees in the store can have a cash register, a point of sale system on their iPad, on their Microsoft Surface, we have faster transactions, happier customers, and we also reduce the cost to sell a car. I'm gonna take a breath. You've just heard my stick speech. <laughs> it's all good, it's all good. It's all good information. And I, I, I I'm going to double down on a lot of things you said there. Um, uh, I, I did a, a, a post this morning and it was a lot on customer service. And last week it was just like, and we've all had really bad customer experience because unfortunately there's more bad customer experience than good. Whatever, whatever it may be, there's, we don't need to get into it. Bottom line is I actually said about it was, Apple store. I brought up that in particular because they empower their employees. And I understand that when it comes to the auto industry, that there's this overwhelming uh, cloud that says, oh, well, we can't do that because we're going to lose the F&I office. It's a culture shift and you can go to one, all, one point cell and you, you, you really can do that. And there's just this fear that, oh, we're, we can't do that. We, we're going to lose the F&I office. No, you're not. It's just this, got, you can make that switch there. So the fact that you, you, you know, that you talked about this and touched on this, I love that. It's just, you got to make that change and it's baby steps. You don't do it. All right, we're going to put this in place. We're going to do it today. No, this is years of changing and baby step and doing this. And I'm sure that, you know, Chip Perry, and he talks about this all the time. And it's a very slow and steady change over time. But just in general, just the whole change here is, I'm, I'm, I love everything about it. It's just the customer service in general is just so, 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 so big. Uh, and when it comes to whether you want to call it digital retailing or modern retailing, and uh, I feel like every single time I wake up, there's a new company out there that says, hey, look at us, we do it. No, you don't. You're a modified, you're, you're a glorified payment calculator is what you are. You've done nothing to do anything with the in-store experience. When a customer comes in, either some, an either an OEM or some big brother has told you, you have to slap a button on your website and that's all you've done. You've done nothing else. So all you've done is putting a button on your website and no one else has bought into the stupid experience. So you've done this to suffice somebody up top that told you, you have to do this. And then someone else said, well, you got to put this on there because it, you know, I get a kickback from it. Well, now I've got someone out. Now you've got 10 CTAs on your website, which are all uh, digital retailing tools. But when the customer gets there, what the hell is happening? Well, I don't know. Yeah. I clicked on this button, this button. Is anybody, and then forget Google analytics because they're now they're all screwed up and everyone's going all different directions. So that's a whole other experience. So now you get in store and you're making the customer start from scratch. So for, at, at what point are you even branding this? So if, you're, if you've now sinking money into branding it and you're branding that, oh, you're going to save all this time. If I can tell you that if I order from Starbucks and I order my chai latte, soy chai latte, grande, no water, no <laughs> salt, and I get there and it's not there. I'm going to go batshit crazy. <laughs> it better be there. And that's over. And yes, is it overpriced at six bucks? Hell yes, it is. But that's over a freaking coffee. That's over a coffee. We're talking a $50,000 car. So I just, there's such a disconnect that we're freaking out over a coffee. And I know that Starbucks is ingrained in this, but we're trying to be the Amazon experience. We're trying to be 
claim they're Apple. We're not that. We're not, we're not even close to that because the in-store experience sucks. It's horrible. So well, I, 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 yeah, it, it, it does in some places, but I think there's a lot of retailers that are making progress and have focus yes. on this. And there and are, so there are, there are. There's some that do a very good job, but overall they suck. Well, yeah, okay. Uh, we can find good examples of that. No, for I'm sure, saying there, I, there are there are some that do a really good job. There are, but overall. I would, the ones that I've seen, they're just slapping a button on their website because they don't understand the branding process. Yes, no? Well, I think that there's a couple things happening on, on websites is that, and uh, the, the first is that people kind of treat them the way they used to treat newspaper ads, meaning there's some white space left. Can't we put something oh, there? Oh, God. Yes. And if, if we have a call to action button, maybe we'd get more leads if we had five of those. And so there's this concept of the, the paralysis of choice, where if you give me five choices, I don't know what to do. If you give me one or two choices, many times I'll pick one. I think what, what, what is challenging for digital retail right now is that When we think about it as e-commerce, can you imagine if you shopped on Amazon and you knew and all your friends told you, if you go over to the Amazon store and talk to the sales manager, they'll reduce the price of your order. <laughs> How likely would you be to continue on? So having e-commerce without price trust is a pretty hard thing. Oh, yeah. Now, that doesn't mean it can't serve a function. You get an approximate payment, you kind of figure out where you are, but most customers, I don't think, have the trust level to say, on this $50,000 purchase, I'm getting the market price or the dealer's most competitive price. So you start with, and this will sound a little harsh, a fake price yep. that creates a fake payment that doesn't connect to an in-store experience that ain't omni-channel retailing mm -mm. that's lead generation yep now the leads are awesome you got a customer with personal information you got a vehicle you got an approximate price and on some days you got a credit app that's a fabulous that's lead awesome don't confuse it with omni-channel retail or e-commerce because it's not there yet and that's why I think, I mean, let me, let me back up a second. As far as I know, the most impressive technologist in the history of the universe who is planning to send people to Mars can't sell a Tesla online completely yet. You can make a reservation, but you go to the store and that's on purpose because they have a retail experience. They have beautiful stores. So there's a lot of reasons why I'm not a huge fan of Elon Musk, but he must be respected. And so franchise dealers were trying to compete with that by saying, let's not have the real price and let's not have the real payment and let's call it e-commerce. It, it's not yet. It's and not. a couple off that Tesla, um, I always find it interesting. And I love, I, Elon is... He's Elon. I mean, he's a genius. Right. He's a little crazy at times. He's, he's Thomas Edison. He's yeah. Thomas Edison. Yeah. And I, he would never, and I know that we'd always go over the, the surveys that you'd get every single year from the OEMs of how they'd rank the OEMs. And Tesla would always be dead last. And he'd always come out and say, I'm glad we are, because how they are judging those, it's based on arbitrary questions. And I want to make sure that we're taking care of the customer and Tesla customers and Tesla, Tesla clientele they're always very happy with the experience. He goes, so I'm fine with the fact that we are dead last because we're taking care of the customer. Now, whether he is trying to swoon that, but it was always a very interesting, he's like, I don't care as long as we're taking care of our customers. I was like, ah, you know, it was just a very different tune on things, but I was like, yeah, I can see where he's coming from on that, but they're always dead last on those, um, on those surveys as you and I'd always see, but, um, but he's yeah, got pretty, a they point pretty that high are very happy. Yeah, they have, they have uh, enviable brand loyalty for sure. Yes, very, very much so. Uh, so 
in the in-store experience, how would you say that your in-store experience is different? There are some other companies out there that do focus on the in-store experience. So how is Fuses different than other companies? Well, first of all, um, it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's our experience. I'd say it's the dealer's experience and we, we help with that. So okay. um, we have a consulting division in our company. It's actually a, one of our, um, one of our uh, officers uh, was previously a consultant and he spent 12 years helping dealers convert to modern retail, whether it's one price or single point of contact. So we have the process management, the business transformation experience, the, the consulting chops to help dealers move to where they want to go. And so, as you said, this is a journey. There are some dealers who they want to jump off the cliff and we can do that. We can say, you want to move to one price, single point of contact, we can facilitate that. And we've done it about 300 times. So I, I would say there's probably nobody that has more experience in this type of transformation. We're involved right now with Ford of Canada, where we're uh, converting virtually all of their stores to these new ways of doing business. We have a lot of big clients in the U.S. as well. Um, so we, we've got the chops there. But for most dealers, this is a step-by-step -step process where they're going, okay, I get the single point of contact. I get why that's a better customer experience, but you know, I'm, the only money I'm making on the front end, save for the last uh, year of chip shortage, is in F&I. <clears throat> so they need to move slowly. And I'll, I'll give you an example of how somebody moves methodically. And they go, look, I'm not getting rid of the finance office. Okay, fine. But every store has a couple of salespeople, that do between 25 and 40 cars a month, month in, month out. And most of them are in the CRM figuring their own lease. Most of them come up to the desk once a month and say, ah, gosh, I forgot to put the reserve in, but it's a good customer. And, and you roll on because it's a 40 car person. Mm -hmm. Those people are perfect to start with a single point of contact to give them the Fuse application and to say, okay, if you're going to run your own deals, let's make sure that we've configured the dealer's profit goals. Let's make sure you have a professional F&I presentation within that. And let's empower you to not sell 40 cars, but to sell 50. Let me give you an example. This is an edge case for sure, but uh, we have a salesperson that works in a store that that uses Fuse. He's 26 years old, been selling cars for five years now. He got his training uh, to be in business by working at Chili's. And in 2021, he averaged 72 cars a month. His best month was 102. And so when we think about productivity, we have to think with kind of new goals now. Mm -hmm. Because when you're doing the transaction yourself, when you have that trust and rapport with customers, particularly past customers and referrals, this can go really, really quickly. And his CSI is above average. His PVR is above average as well. Now, again, he's an edge case. But we used to talk about the 50 car person as, oh, my God, how'd they do that? 72 cars a month, that's three every working day of Insane. the year. Insane. It's crazy. Yeah. And um, so think about your top performers when you're making these incremental changes. What could we do to help them really increase productivity, increase profitability for the dealership? Then you can think about maybe the, the rest of the store. You mentioned Apple before, and I think that what sometimes is missed in the Apple store is how hard they work at that. Um, I have a copy of their training manual. It, it's confidential. You can, you can sometimes search it out on the internet. And it is meticulous the way they treat their, the way they teach their people to treat customers and to build that trust and loyalty and to incidentally have the highest 
sales per square foot of any retailer on the planet. And so uh, a lot of this does come down to training. Software doesn't solve any problems. Behind every dealership, Brooke, there is a graveyard full of software that dealers bought because they thought software will solve my problem. 100%. And, just, keep throwing, yeah. just keep throwing money at it. It'll go away. Well, or keep buying the software. Okay, the, the process first. I'll tell you uh, an interesting story. When we were developing Fuse, we built the whole process manually. We said, okay, so uh, let's imagine that we have software. And so we would make a car deal, put it in a folder. We would slip it under a locked door inside that room was a finance person who would do the payments and send it back as if we were seeing it on the screen. We would be faxing documents no. inside the store. And so we were able to walk every piece of paper, every document through a process. And we made a map of that and That's said, awesome. now we have to build software to do as much of that as we can. We didn't start building software and tell dealers, tell our own dealerships, you have to adapt to the software. We figured out the exact process map, and then we built software to power it. And That's hence, incredible. we got people selling 72 cars a month because there's no friction in this. Yeah. And, we, you know, that okay, that's an edge case. Uh, there's, there's always a world record holder. <laughs> but, but, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a personal story. My, uh, my daughter, who had a career in social work and she liked it but she didn't like begging her boss to move her from $18 an hour to $20 an hour she has a family and she needed to do more do better and I never pushed my kids to get into the business I am and she said you know should I interview should I try it and I said yeah fine so she went to a store that uses Fuse they gave, this is a Walzer store, a uh, Honda store. They gave her eight weeks of training before she hit the floor. And her first month she sold 30 and she's never been below that. Now I think, okay, she's my kid. I think she has a knack, but there's no way you can do that consistently over the months without training and a process and then software that enables it. And I'll say another thing that I think is, really important it's the management system that goes with modern retailing and so if we look at a walzer store um and i'll you know here's here's a an example you'll go into one of their larger stores the toyota store sells give or take 700 cars a month there are no finance offices and there is not a sales desk how does that work it works because Sales managers, they call them team leads, are on the floor and they don't buy cars and they don't do dealer trades. They coach and they help people make car deals. Funny concept. And that's their whole that's their whole focus. They can never say, hey, I'm too busy. Mm -hmm. You know, I gotta order cars today, or I gotta call somebody about a dealer trade. Other people do that, and these team leads. We think of them particularly with newer salespeople as lifeguards. Mm -hmm. So if you got a great swimmer in the pool, you're not paying too much attention. If you've got somebody new, you don't wait till they're in the deep end before you jump in with them. And so that's one of the things in this personal story that my daughter benefited from. She's got a great manager who coached her and didn't let her slip into the deep end of the pool. Combine that with training process and software, and you got somebody new to the car business that's selling 30 cars a month. And I will tell you that for somebody like that, it's just a wonderful story. It's life-changing money. Yeah. It's life-changing job satisfaction to be able to achieve that. And it's, I, I there first off kudos to walzers i mean it's uh, as great as this industry has been to both you, both of us um it, there are pros and cons to our our industry um the weather uh, period that just period there's no and if there's pros and cons 
you look at Walls or you look at a Chick-fil-A, you look at CarMax, Disney, there's uh, Apple. They do such a great job with training. Before you ever come on board, do you fit our mold? And are you willing to go through all this? If you don't, thank you. Next, please. And so sure. it's so wonderful at Walzer is, and there are other companies as well in our industry that have said, okay, we are going to train you for the most part in our industry. That is where we, we falter a little bit. It's just like, good luck. We're going to throw you in the deep end. Good luck. Hope you can swim with a 10 pound weight above your head. And it's so <laughs> important <laughs> that we just, we train our, train our people. Um, I was talking to a, a colleague, uh, God, it was probably like a while ago and her son never worked the car industry. And just, he, he went from Chick-fil-A, oddly enough, into the car industry. And he's just like, what the crap is this? Like, I don't know what I'm doing. They're like, oh, you'll figure it out. And it's just like, you know, we, this, we've got to do a better job training our employees. You can't just expect them to figure this out. Like, that's not how things are done. Oh, I'll sit in front of the computer. You'll figure it out. Get some training stuff. Go talk to our rep. No, eight weeks, Walzer takes. Uh, I think it was, I'm trying, and I'm going to screw up the stats here, but Taco Bell does a training and it was, and it was just to make one taco and the extent that it takes to, <laughs> have, you, have, you, have you heard this? No, but I can only imagine. It, it was nuts. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll have to go back and research this, but the amount that the training they take just to make one freaking taco, I was like, we're, we're talking about Taco Bell. Are you kidding me? And I was astounded by the amount of training that they went through uh, to make a taco. I was like, I, anyways, it was just at the end of the day is we have, we have got to invest in our people. So when you're, when you look around and say, why is everyone quitting on us? Why can't we hire people? Well, it's because you're not invested in your people. If you invest in your people, they know that you care about them. Empower your people. They know you care about them. Uh, so it's just, I, I love hearing about what, like you said, the Walzer group and all these other groups that really yeah. care about their employees. You know, and I think there's a lot of really good examples. So there, well, there's not an outlier anymore. We've got Shomp in Denver. We got DG, DG, the California, uh, Holler in Florida. You know, I could name a bunch of them. Har, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Glansman Subaru. I mean, there, there's a bunch of these stores now that are, you know, I think doing really interesting things that are that are seeing a different way. And I think in some cases, the pandemic, our inventory shortages have given us a little opportunity here to change, to experiment a little bit. Some of it's been forced on us, but I think other people found that the initiatives they had underway have started to bear some fruit during these tough times. And so we're, we're probably not going back to the way it, it used to be. Yeah, I, I hope not. I, I think for, I think for everyone's sake, it just benefits everyone where we can look back and say, what have we learned and how can we grow from this? Because it does, it benefits not just the, the consumer and the clients, it, it benefits the company as a whole. Because if your customer's happy, they're going to keep coming back and they're going to tell their friends that they're happy and their friends are going to tell them that they're happy. So yeah. it does, it benefits everybody. So it's a, I, yeah, th thank you for sharing that. That's, that's really awesome. Um, okay, so anyone that comes on, board with uh, facts, not feelings. Uh, I've got a couple of questions. We're going to do this round, uh, uh, some random questions here. So buckle in. You ready for this? I'm ready for the lightning round. Yeah. Let's All go. Right. I, I wish I had a <laughs> lightning round here. All right. First and foremost, I, I know you kind of answered this at the beginning here, but we're, I, I got to circle back on it. So what is your favorite thing to do outside of work? Like favorite hobby, things to do with unwind? Yeah. Okay. So uh, there's kind of two things. One is fly fishing, uh, obviously when the weather permits. And the reason I like it is that you can't do it and focus on the fishing and think about your problems. Very it's virtually impossible. You got to be in the moment. And so um, uh, there, there's an old cliche and it's especially true in Montana and that's the trout don't live in ugly places. So uh, I like big outdoors. I like fly fishing in the in the winter. Uh, I like to ski. I'm uh, my my home is uh, give or take thirty five minutes from Big Sky Ski Area, and so twenty close. minutes from Bridger Bowl. So uh, I'm uh, I'm uh, lucky in that that's regard. A, big Sky. It's been a while since I've been there, but I, I've last time I was there. It was back when I actually could snowboard and I wasn't banned from contact sports. So yeah, it's gorgeous there. Yeah. yeah. Very, very pretty. 
All right. What is your favorite vacation spot? Or if you had a, a round trip or one way trip and you didn't want to come back, where, where are you heading? Okay. So that's a good one. I'll, uh, and I'll give you two answers for that. Um, uh, my son, who also lives in, in Bozeman, um, uh, I had to laugh once I was with a colleague of mine and uh, he asked my son, what do you do? And my son said, let me put it this way. My life would be your vacation. So I'm in a pretty good spot that a lot of people pay a lot of money to, to come and have a vacation. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's my first answer. My second answer is um, that I like Hawaii. Uh, and uh, depending on the island you're on, it is still paradise in a lot of places. And so um, that that's a place that feels uh, uh, really good to me. But uh, on the times when I'm not on vacation, which is most of the time, uh, I feel lucky to be in a pretty cool spot. Uh, I yeah, well, I love Hawaii. So good, good answers. All right, all right. So we've got uh, obviously we're on fact not failing. So in what you do, how how are you, what is something you constantly battle uh, distinguishing facts from feelings and and saying hey. I know you feel this way, but this is actually facts of what's going on. So what's something you constantly battle that's facts from feelings and what you do? Yeah. Um, okay. So, you know, this is, uh, I, I, hopefully my answer will be uh, a little uh, nuanced here. So there, <laughs> there's a distinction we have to make, you know, not everything that's valuable can be measured and not everything that's measured is valuable. Mm -hmm. And so this is an industry full of data that I'm not sure always relates back to successful actions or behaviors. Yes. And so trying to find that meaningful data and then make the right correlation because correlation isn't cause. So. Uh, some of the things that um, I think we battle are when people talk about the leads they might get from digital retailing. <laughs> um, in most cases, I don't think dealers are creating more new customers. I think in many cases, they're finding maybe a better way to engage them, maybe a more positive way to engage them because there is not a correlation that I've found between those leads and market share. And if you're a business owner or a marketer for a dealership, other than your profitability numbers, it's the only number that counts. Are you getting a bigger share of the pie? And so we manage leads and those numbers and we measure conversions. And those are important actions, important KPIs to look at. but I don't have that many conversations with people that are tracking market share on a monthly basis versus same franchise and versus all the other franchises in the market. And it, it's really the acid test. Do uh, we get more of the pie? That is a huge one. Yes. And I caught all the nuance there. So yes, <laughs> <laughs> very, very good one. Uh, yeah. I would, I have one more, I would like to end on that one, but I, I got to ask one more here. So yeah. you are a disruptor in a good way in this industry. So what is something in all your years being a disruptor, what is a good lesson that you've learned and something you would be telling your younger self as a disruptor in this industry? Yeah, so I think one of the, the key things that I've hopefully learned and uh, appreciated is uh, how well-intentioned, good people who want to do well for their company react to change. And change is really difficult and people process it differently. There are some people that look at it as a grand adventure. I can't wait to see what's new. I can't wait to try something else. There are other people when faced with change that go, why are we messing with this? I'm very comfortable where I am. It's working fine. Why are you changing 
the world for me. And so I, I've learned to be one, I think, more patient and also to meet people where they are and understand that this is not right or wrong. This is part of your emotional makeup. It's part of your background, your, the way you were treated in your family. Uh, and so we can't expect everybody to react the same way to a new initiative. And uh, I would say that in the work that we do that, that I've been involved in over the past years, that the, this is a tremendous skill to cultivate for any manager and that's change management. Because coming up with good ideas, coming up with a better way to do it, that turns out to be easier than getting a whole team to follow you and embrace change and move a business ahead because change is frightening and uh, there, there needs to be some kindness, some empathy, some understanding with your fellow team members so that you can all move along towards the future. And uh, I think my younger self was way too impatient and way too judgmental because my emotion is I love change. I love seeing what's next. That doesn't mean it's right. And it doesn't mean everybody else should feel the same way I do. I just was like the last like 10 minutes, we could just like broadcast that everywhere. Uh, everything you just said, it's just, it, I just want to put like one of those like little cats hanging on a poster or something like hang in there. And it's just like Alan. I mean, it was very, very wise words. So everyone listening, please take what Alan just said um, and let that sink in all of it. Uh, everything from the, the last question, the question before that, very, very true. It, patience and meeting people where they are. That is just so, so true. It's uh, people are reluctant to change. Change is hard and it's very difficult. And uh, some people want to move on and find, try the newest and greatest thing. And maybe even when it, you shouldn't be changing, oh, I want to change again. So meeting people exactly where they are, it, it's difficult. Uh, so yeah. Alan, thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure. I've loved chatting with you and catching up with you. Thank you for being yeah, on the too. show. And yeah, thank you for it. And once again, Fuse, te, Fuse uh, I'll drop the link in below. It's just been such a pleasure. Thank you. It's good to see you again, Brooke. I sure enjoyed our conversation. Let's yes. try to do it again. And um, when you're in Montana, fly fishing, we will go. Yes, I, I, and you got to <laughs> teach me. I, I tried once and it didn't go so well. So uh, <laughs> even like trying to get the, the, the I'm going to screw up the words here, like the string on the rod. For, the line. Line, the there rod. we go. Look at the line on the rod. There we go. There we go. <laughs> All right, everyone. Have a wonderful week. Have an awesome weekend. And then always be kind, be safe, be uh, just be an awesome, have awesome customer service. Treat everyone well. Thank you, everyone.